on right now. Record this mouse on the podium. It's just a regular old mouse, so just left click to go forward, scroll up on the scroll wheel to go back on your slides. Okay, it's sitting, it's sitting on. Welcome, everyone. Welcome everyone, miigwech. Good afternoon, King's University College is situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haneda-Sane, the Lenape, and the Arawandaran peoples who have a long-standing relationship with the region and with the city of London. There are three local First Nations communities in close proximity to King's as well. The Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, the Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. In the region of southwestern Ontario, more generally, there are 11 First Nations communities and a growing indigenous urban population. King's recognizes the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and the original peoples of Turtle Island, or North America, to the development of Canada. My name is Joe Mikalski. I'm the Associate Academic Dean here at King's, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the King's Hour for Wednesday, January 25th. The structure of our monthly event has varied to some degree, but the basic format today includes a special talk by our guest speaker, and then that'll be followed by a question and answer period. So we have mics set up on either side if you'd like to ask questions. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Christina uh, Jacoby, uh, who will introduce our speaker for the day, Christina. Jennifer Keysmat is a founding partner of Office for Urbanism, a planning and design firm in Toronto, specializing in the integration of planning, design, and consensus building processes. She serves as Chief Planner and Executive Director of City Planning for the City of Toronto. Ms. Keysmat is a Registered Professional Planner, an award-winning member of the Canadian Institute of Planners, and a member of the Congress for New Urbanism. She has a Combined Honours BA from Western and an MES degree in Urban Planning from York University, where she studied the political processes that shape urban environments. Thank you very much, Christina. Joe, it's absolutely fabulous to be here uh, back on Western campus. I have to say, London is just far enough away from Toronto that we don't seem to make it out here very often. And whenever I get here, I'm always amazed by how much the campus is changing and evolving and growing. And there's an energy here that I absolutely love. Um, I do say to my children that the time I spent at Western is actually uh, one of the happiest times of my life. It was also a time when I was poorer than I've ever been, so I tend to make that point, that I, I happened to be, you know, I didn't have much, but I was so happy. It was such a rich experience being at this university. It was a dynamic place that informed and shaped me in many ways, and I'll be forever grateful for that. So I'm very happy to be here today to speak to you as part of this lecture. And I've titled this presentation, Building Cities That Work. And really what I want to talk about today are a lot of ideas, but in many ways, a simple idea. And from my perspective, a simple idea that can, in, fa in fact, transform our cities. Because in the 21st century, we are living in the age of cities. And getting our cities right is about getting health right. It is about getting community right. It is about getting environmental sustainability right. It is about recognizing and respecting populations that came before and recognizing and respecting the populations that will, in fact, follow us. So cities bring together a whole variety, variety of critical components of the human project. And I'll talk about those different components uh, as I weave through this presentation. Now, let me see if I can get this uh, slide to advance. Oops. Sorry, just having, I've got the click there. I will use, I'll use the, 
No, that's the left one. There we go. Might be a tiny bit delayed. Um, are cities, in a very reductionist kind of way, are our habitats. They are the places that are an ecological and an environmental area that are habitat, are, uh, are occupied by various species. And in the context of a city, that species, of course, is a human being. We have the capacity to adapt and shape and transform our habitats. And we've seen over the course of human history, there have been very different ideas that have informed how we have created and designed our human habitats. Some of those ideas better, some of those ideas for worse. Some of those ideas that have resulted in the flourishing of human life and equality and activity and commerce and other areas that have in fact detracted from the flourishing of human beings. And what I'd like to do is walk through a little bit of a very recent narrative that we see in our cities. And I'm going to use my city, the city of Toronto, as my example. In Toronto, we used to design our habitat around streetcar lines. This is, in fact, a photo from 1910. Between 1910 and 1930, we built a whole series of communities around our streetcar lines that were, in fact, dynamic, flourishing places. Every corner of the city was served by an extensive system of streetcars that served communities, and they were, of course, known as streetcar suburbs. But in fact, they were very different from the modern suburb that we see today for a simple reason. They had a mixture of uses, not just housing, but a mixture of uses, as well as densities that allowed for a very pedestrian community to evolve. Uh, this is a very interesting image because it's from the city of Toronto. For those of you who know Toronto a little bit, all of the area shown here is south of St. Clair, really considered the core today. And if you can imagine, there were nine different streetcar systems with nine different fares that you paid. But what this points to is how the streetcar suburb was really the backbone of the movement system that existed in the city. Now we have to ask an important question, and that question is, how is it that cities have transformed and changed? How is it that as our cities have evolved, we've really lost that connection between walkable urban places? We know that the private automobile, when it was introduced and became part of the mainstream in the 40s and the 50s and 60s, began to fundamentally transform and reshape the way it is that we live. We started to design and build urban habitats that look much like this. We actually severed the link between density, a mixture of uses, and walkable communities assuming that planning our communities around cars would create a tremendous amount of freedom. In fact, the opposite has happened. There's a burden associated with creating and designing communities around cars, including the fact that you need to own a car. That in and of itself is onerous and creates a serious equity problem around how we design and create our communities. But there's other problems. There's, of course, the environmental in impact, there's also the challenge that we have with creating places where people, in fact, interact on a daily basis and are a part of one another's lives. Because the vehicle became the connecting point between the various uses created in our cities. And this is a habitat that was no longer for people. This, in fact, became a habitat or places that are predominantly designed to accommodate cars. And there's a fundamental shift taking place in our urbanism today, and that is a shift that recognizes that creating our habitats around cars as being the central feature and focus of how we design our cities is inherently problematic, meaning we need to hit the reset button and design in a very different way. Now, I'm not suggesting that cars are going to disappear from our cities uh, altogether, but I do believe that we're going to continue to see 
over the next 10 to 20 years, a reorientation in cities that thrive to be around creating walkable, dynamic, mixed-use communities. And autonomous vehicles will have a very important role to play in this because the whole idea of owning a car becomes an absurdity when, you are no, when that car can be driven around and being used when you're not in it. Today, the average car sits idle 98% of the time. It's an incredible investment. It's an expense. And yet, it sits idle, depreciating 98% of the time. The great opportunity of autonomous vehicles is not that we continue to design our cities around cars. We must go back to these fundamental principles of urbanism and design our cities around people and recognize cars as being one component of a broader system that is designed to move people from place to place. So these are not habitats for people that we've generally created. And I'm showing you images that could be plucked from any municipality in Ontario. But these are, in fact, images from the suburbs of uh, Toronto. In fact, what we see in Toronto is that utilitarian walkability in much of Toronto's inner suburbs are shaded here in this map in dark red and orange indicate very low levels of walkability. It was those traditional suburbs, which is the area that's not shadowed in, in red or orange in this map, that in fact today have been resilient as being walkable places. And imagine they also, of course, have the highest real estate prices because the opportunity of living in a walkable community means you have the opportunity of being able to do a whole variety of things within daily life, within walking distance of home, instead of being dependent on needing to drive everywhere. So there's a direct link that we must establish between how we design our cities and the opportunity for creating a greener, more equitable, more community-oriented place that allows people to know their neighbors, to reduce our individual environmental footprints, and also to create places that are inherently safer. So this is a uh, map showing some transportation tomorrow survey data in the city of Toronto. And what you see on this map is the modal split in different parts of the city. And there's a very important narrative here. The downtown core, right in the center of the city, is divided up about a third, a third, a third. So what you see there is about a third of the population is driving to work, a third of the population is taking transit to work, and a third of the population is walking and cycling to work. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. If you look at the suburbs, so these were the, these were the red and yellow areas on the map. In those areas, where we have a fundamentally different design, it's that design of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, where we in fact said, okay, Let's take the car as our central starting point. Let's assume everyone has a car and design our communities based on that assumption, as opposed to the earlier design, which was design based on transit and design based on walkability. In those areas of the city where we, in fact, designed our city around cars, we actually have a fundamental challenge, and that is our modal split results in people primarily moving around in their cars, 70% in Etobicoke, 68% in Scarborough and North York, a very small percentage cycling and walking, and then a higher percentage between uh, 16 and 25% that is in fact taking transit. We cannot in fact adapt our suburbs fast enough to accommodate the transit demand. The challenge is the road network is not very adaptable. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways when we focus on building cities that work, we can begin to transform our urban landscape by using the existing street network, the existing densities that we have, and really transforming them through new transit, new densities, and new uses. And I'll show you some examples of that. This is really about beginning to solve this problem. Part of what wasn't contained in the promise of our car-oriented or auto-oriented suburbs 
what no one really talked about back in the 50s and 60s was that you were now going to be spending on average 85 minutes a day sitting in your car commuting back and forth to work. What's important about this is we now have hard evidence that demonstrates that we have not been able to deliver on the promise. The promise of living in one area and working in one area and being able to very quickly zip between those two areas and have a very high quality of life, in fact, we have not been able to deliver on that. Instead, what we see are long commutes. We have, in fact, great job density in our downtown core and we have employment density in our downtown core. Uh, we have a population in downtown Toronto that rivals the entire population of the City of London, just within 17 square kilometers. It's also the fastest growing area of the city. This is a critical issue for cities like London to take note of. There's a reason why downtown Toronto is growing so quickly. The reason is because it is possible to live in the, car, in the core and not to own a car. We are seeing tremendous job growth, multinational corporations coming into the downtown core of Toronto for one simple reason. They want to be close to the future workforce and that future workforce doesn't want the long commute. That future workforce has said, forget it. We're not spending 85 minutes a day in the car. We would prefer not to have a lawn, to live in a smaller place, but to be able to walk to work, to walk to a baseball game or a Raptors game, or to walk to the theater. That is a trade-off that the millennial generation is making loudly. It's not something that we need to research to understand. We just need to go look at the real estate market in downtown Toronto and in the Toronto region as a whole. Highest prices in the areas where you can walk and take transit. The driver of that growth is young people, many of whom, in fact, grew up in suburbs. And in the work that we've been doing in our condo communities in the downtown core, we're hearing a couple of things. The first is that many of the young people moving into the car, sorry, moving into the core, are in fact people who grew up in the suburbs, who've said, you know what, been there, done that. I'm not spending all that time commuting. And why would I spend so much of my income on a car when I can put it into an asset like a condo and know that I'm going to grow that asset and I'm going to have a better quality of life? So that's the first. The second is, in fact, this relationship between employment and density that we see in our core. About 15 years ago, TD Bank spread out all across the 905, 13 different core offices across the region. Five years ago, they, in fact, consolidated back in the core. They consolidated back in the core for a very simple reason. It was an HR strategy employee retention and re employee recruitment. Easier to recruit and retain employees in a walkable urban area. Mid-sized cities like the City of London and mid-sized cities across Canada are at a risk if they continue to sprawl outward, ignoring the desire for a more sustainable urban footprint that is in fact being driven not only by a much broader awareness and understanding of the impacts that transportation and buildings have on creating carbon uh, emissions that we need to reduce. It's not only that, but that's a big part of the story. It's also about quality of life. I have a podcast that's called uh, Invisible City, invisiblecitypodcast.com. Uh, You're welcome to look it up. I have a podcast uh, episode that's called Five Kids, One Condo. And you can probably figure out what it's about. Uh, a parent who has five kids living in his one small condo. And he lived in the suburbs and commuted for 45 minutes each way. Very typical commute. And then on Saturday mornings, he woke up and he mowed his lawn and he fixed up his house and he worried about his things. And one day he had an epiphany that he was spending all his time commuting to a house that was a burden to take care of and that what really mattered most in his life was his relationships with his kids. So moving into a condo in the core, and this is a story from Vancouver, but moving into the condo in the core was a lifestyle choice 
It was an opportunity to focus on what really mattered, getting an hour and a half back in every day to spend with his kids. Being available to pop out of a, a, a meeting, uh, out to a meeting in the evening and pop back and still be home in time to put his kids to bed instead of arriving home every day and his kids already being asleep. There's a fundamental quality of life opportunity that's tied to health and that is also tied to environmental sustainability that can be delivered by creating communities that are walkable. Now, we know from um, our, uh, some research undertaken by the province that the carbon emissions by sector demonstrates that how we move is in fact one of the greatest impacts on our local habitat. And we can focus on green buildings, and buildings are second on the list. We can focus on waste. We can focus on electricity. But if we do not focus on how we move, we will not shrink our environmental footprint. Years ago, I was working on creating a downtown plan, and I had a committee that was very concerned and preoccupied with environmental sustainability. This was in the city of Halifax. And we were talking about green buildings and how we could ensure that we had lead standard buildings with energy efficiency. And the chair of the committee came up to me and said, you know, uh, and the whole plan was about infill. The whole plan was about curbing growth on the periphery of the city and driving growth into the existing built-up areas. And the chair of the committee came up to me and said, you know, I just don't think this is a very green plan. We need to focus more on building materials and building design. And I actually pulled out some similar data to this. And the great irony of the story was that I later learned that this chair of the committee, who was an architect, lived in a lead gold house. 45 minutes outside of the city. And the irony was lost on him that if he evaluated, as Bill Reese in his ecological footprint analysis encourages all of us to do, if he evaluated his personal footprint, he, he was in fact had a higher environmental footprint than someone who's living in the core in just a regular old leaky building with poor energy efficiency. So the role of transportation in addressing climate change and our Paris Agreement commitments cannot be understated. And it's directly linked in to how we plan and how we design our cities. Now, we also know that how we design our cities with respect to transportation has a considerable health-related implication. In Canada, every year we spend $8 billion on health care due to the impacts of air pollution. Air pollution is directly related to industry, but also to how we move. So I'd like to ask the question, if one simple idea could make cities really work, what if there's one simple idea that could make cities work for everyone? And I'd like to suggest that it's this. Building complete communities like the ones we used to build, remember those streetcar suburbs, where people can live, work, and shop within close proximity is about building cities that will work for future generations. Those streetcar suburbs have retained their resiliency. They've retained their value. They've retained their desirability. We have an opposite challenge with many of our car-oriented suburbs, particularly if you've seen some of the suburbs in the states that were hit very hard by the Great Recession. It's cities that did not have a mix of use, that were heavily reliant on subsidized infrastructure, subsidized sidewalks, pipes, water. Those are the communities that, in fact, have the least resilience. Cities that work, that have resilience in the future, are cities where we're bringing the uses in close proximity. So you have the choice to live close to where you work and to walk to work so that you have the opportunity to shop on foot. Shopping not once a week, but maybe every other day on your way home from work, picking up your fresh groceries. Cities where you have the opportunity when you need to get somewhere beyond your neighborhood to take excellent public transit to get there. Cities where you have the opportunity to simply have car to go or car share for the moments where you need a car, because there's a whole variety of other things that you can do in your neighborhood 
on your bike by walking or taking transit. Complete communities present us with this opportunity, and I'd like to give you a couple of examples of how we can make these transportations happen. In one American study, it was found that walking trips increase by 24% when the number of shops and services in a neighborhood increased from four to five. In other words, when people are given destinations within close proximity to home, walking becomes a good choice. It's not just about sidewalks. Uh, in another study in Montreal, it was found that women over the age of 45 were 53% more likely to walk at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week, if they lived in a higher density neighborhood that had more shops and services. We now know that there's a direct correlation by walking for 20 minutes a day and reducing heart disease, diabetes, strokes, improving mental health in senior citizens, directly correlated to walking 20 minutes a day. If we integrate walking as part of our everyday life, this isn't in fact a burden, it's a pleasure. And being healthy is something that comes as a result of the way we have designed our communities. In another American study, it was found that complete communities actually produced 20% fewer vehicle-related emissions than others. So really, we need to look at the way in our city building that our policy frameworks actually deliver on cities that work on supporting green, complete communities. And I'd like to show you a few examples how we're seeking to do this in the Toronto context. And the first is this. We already have a dense walkable urban centre, but we already, but we also have, and you can see on the far side of the screen, very low density neighbourhoods. We have densities, sorry, we have avenues where we are adding density, and we have apartment neighbourhoods. Our objective is in fact, and I'm not sure why my centre isn't showing up, but think of uh, areas that are in Scarborough and North York that are transitioning, not quite an urban centre like a downtown, but in fact there's a series of blocks of a higher density, higher intensity urban form. We in fact have an opportunity to look at the entire urban structure of our cities and identify the areas that are working reap the good ideas in terms of what makes those areas work, and then look at the areas that need to transition and transform. And in particular in our suburbs, this is about our avenues. Just having a little problem with the slide here. I'll keep talking so as not to lose the the next slide I'm going to show you actually shows an overview is that one right there, of, the, of the entire city and the areas, particularly in our suburbs, where we can transform our suburbs from being environments where there really, there really aren't any destinations within walking distance. There really isn't anywhere to go where we can add density adjacent to the low-rise residential neighborhoods, creating new destinations within walking distances. It's not clicking for some mysterious reason. There we go. So you can see here the mustard-colored areas on the slide. Those are areas typically right in the heart of low-rise areas that are adjacent to them, where we can add infill development to begin to transform neighborhoods that aren't currently walkable, that aren't currently transit oriented, into being the places where it's possible to begin doing the activities of everyday life within walking distance of home. So this is an example of what some of our typical suburbs in the Toronto context look like. And you can see here that um, you can imagine some areas, many areas in London that look just like this main corridors that have strip malls or low density uses. In some instances, there's 1960 tower blocks like there is in this, where you have the density, but you don't have the built form to encourage walking. The buildings are separated from the street. It's in fact might not be a very far distance to get to the corner store, but it's designed in such a way that you would never really walk. 
The stores actually were surrounded by parking. It wasn't designed for pedestrian activity. So our goal is to transform it and design it for pedestrian activity. This is how that community can begin to transform. Building new buildings that we bring up to the edge of the street to create a strong pedestrian environment at the edge of the street, and also to ensure that retail serves a pedestrian population, which it doesn't really serve when it's set back from the street and when you have to navigate through a parking lot in order to get to it. It doesn't really encourage walking. The next level of iteration, building out this same type of typology on the other side of the street, taking away the uses that are low density, adding more housing in a more urban form, and adding pedestrian amenities, like the crosswalk you see here, that has been added to shorten the distance for pedestrians crossing the street. And then the next layer, of course, you can see bus rapid transit that's been added here in its own right of way with green infrastructure that's been added along the street edge in order not only to beautify, but also to provide a separation for a bike lane and also to add the infrastructure required to collect stormwater at the source instead of sending stormwater off into our broader drainage system. Now think in your mind of a power center, just a traditional power center. This is the policy framework that we have proposed for the Golden Mile in Toronto. This is a power center like every other power center that you would see. This area is transforming as a result of a significant public investment in LRT. And the goal is to lead with the investment in transit in such a way that it becomes viable and acts as an incentive for the development industry to, be, to begin reconceiving and reconceptualizing how the uses in an existing area might work. Now, this is Dufferin Street in another part of the city, and it, of course, has huge potential to become a complete community. You can see how deep the lots are. And typically, this is one of our challenges with main streets and adapting main streets, is that you don't really have enough lot depth to add a significant amount of density without providing terrible shadows on adjacent low-rise areas. But along Dufferin, we have significant lot depth that in fact allows us to build out the street as a linear neighborhood as a place where people can live, work, and play. We can put schools along this street, as well as daycares, as well as shops, as well as new housing. This is what the plan for Dufferin looks like. So you can see how we've created new building blocks. We've brought those blocks up to the edge of the street. We've identified where green spaces need to be added for this new linear community. It's important to note that in building out this vision, it's not just about getting density in the mix of uses right. We also need to tie this together with the design of the street and redesigning the street. Because if the street is still designed primarily for cars, it's going to be a pretty hostile environment for pedestrians. So this is what the street design looks like. Because so much of the area is being transformed, we've been able to require a deeper setback, which we then take back as the city in order to create a very wide sidewalk environment. As a result of this wide sidewalk environment, we can add a bike lane where there wasn't one before. We can add green infrastructure. Those are those areas that you see with grasses. Those are storm water management features that allow us to mitigate uh, mitigate flooding, which we know is a significant issue and risk moving forward in the future in our cities. It also allows us, in what was previously really a strip mall with a lot of auto stores, it allows us to create spaces for community life. You see here the chessboard on the edge of the street, places where people can know and interact with their neighbors. And as a result of this plan, this is an example of some of the new projects that are already coming forward. This is a project that is just nearing completion right across the street from Yorkdale Mall, right in the heart of the study area that I just showed you. This is about bringing the buildings to the street in such a way that we create a new edge. We, in fact, begin to provide the clues that this is a place for living. This is a place for being as opposed to primarily being a place to drive through. This is another proposal just south of Lawrence Avenue. 
It's relatively small, it's human scaled, and it is respectful of the adjacent neighborhoods, low rise neighborhoods around it. But interestingly, as a result of these types of proposals, we're able to add new supermarkets, we're able to add new daycare spaces, we're able to add new amenities that serve existing neighborhoods. So whereas some of these neighborhoods, many of these neighborhoods are places where you wouldn't really walk because there's nowhere to walk to, as a result of the infill development, we're transforming the character to become places that work for the 21st century. Now, it's important to note that you need to get the market right in order for this to work. One of the reasons why this works in the Toronto context is because of the Green Belt. The Green Belt, in fact, put a policy framework in place that shifted the land economics and made it viable to build up because we were no longer spreading out. So building these kinds of cities where you have walkable, dense urban places must be linked to policy that's about the edges of the cities. And I frequently meet with cities and municipalities that say, oh, we, we want this, we want this to happen, but we can't get the growth. Like, we need incredible incentives to attract the industry into the downtown core. And this is where I say, Building cities that work in the 21st century demands strong, visionary, public policy. And the Green Belt is that. It's strong, visionary, public policy that has, in fact, transformed the way we are able to attract industry, to attract office, to attract new users, and to provide for a whole new way of living that is in fact fundamentally more sustainable and more like what we were doing in our transit suburbs of the 40s and 50s than this unfortunate era we've just gone through where we focused primarily on a habitat for cars as opposed to what we really ought to do, which is creating a habitat for people. Thank you. I understand there's some time for questions. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm glad you raised that because I. I'm glad you raised that because it's an important part of creating a walkable, accessible city for all. We have a new area that we're developing in the West Donlands. You may know it as the Pan Am Village and the Pan Am Games. And one of our key priorities has been to assure that wheeled access is available so that every part of the city is also available and accessible. So when we talk about creating walkable environments, we want those environments to be fully accessible to people who use wheels as part of their mobility as well. And this is in fact a critical part of creating an accessible city. The two are conjoined. Yes. Well, um, at the risk of speaking about something that I don't know too much about, um, I will make a few very high-level comments, and the high-level high comments are this. I worked a lot, uh, before I became chief planner in Toronto, I worked in many mid-sized Canadian cities. And most mid-sized Canadian cities uh, are ailed by a very simple problem. They have too much land, and they ought to be occupying significantly less land. 
And whereas that land is act actually seen as a rich resource, it's actually compromising quality of life. Bringing things in close is critical to creating walkable communities. It's very simple, really. You're not going to walk if the distance is too long. So bringing in the density and getting the density just right is a critical part of being able to create places where people do have the option to walk a block or two blocks or three blocks to undertake the activities of everyday life. When I moved to Toronto, I was amazed I had, I had never lived in a big city. I live at Young and Eglinton now. And when I moved to Young and Eglinton, which is right at the heart of the city, um, I changed my hairdresser, I changed my doctor, uh, I changed my kid's orthodontist. Uh, I changed all of these things to be within walking distance of home. So that I can do all these things I don't ever drive, I rarely drive on the weekend unless I'm leaving the city, because I can do everything in my neighborhood. I see that as offering me, personally, a very, very high quality of life. One of the things that I didn't realize would be an added benefit of it is the relationship that I have with my neighbors. I've actually lived in much smaller cities and never known my neighbors. I live in a big city and I know most of my neighbors in my neighborhood because I bump into them on the street all the time. Uh, and one of my uh, favorite days of the year is in fact Valentine's Day for a very funny reason which is Valentine's Day in my neighborhood, because there's probably about 50 restaurants within walking distance of my house. Um, on Valentine's Day, you see couples walking down the street, and we bump into everybody that we know on Valentine's Day as we're walking out to the restaurant, and as we're walking home, we know we're going to bump into all of our neighbors, and we'll stop on the street, and we'll chat, and we'll catch up, and we'll find out about a new swimming lesson program that we can enroll our kids in from one of our neighbors, or one of our neighbors will offer you know, an old pair of skates for my son, uh, and that enriches our quality of life. It enriches our, our sense of place. Unfortunately, and this is why I did talk a little bit about the myth not holding, there was a promise associated with suburban sprawl that didn't deliver. Uh, there was a promise around quality of life that didn't deliver, which we see in the long commute, which most people, if you ask them, you know, do you want a long commute, most people would say, well, no, I prefer not a long commute, but alas, it's a situation I find myself in. So I think the opportunity of cities is to think creatively about how to add a diversity of housing types and to build outwards. You have to start with your core because you can't build the critical mass in, by definition, in a variety of different areas in the city. So starting with the most urban part of the city and thinking about how infill can radiate out from that core as being the key priority for creating a walk walkable city is essential. And the greatest, biggest mistake that most mid-sized municipalities make is that they build one tall building over here and then a little bit of density over here and a little bit of density over here. And by the way, we did that too in our suburbs 25 years ago. But the problem is one building doesn't create a walkable community. You need multiple buildings, you need a street network, you need a diversity of housing types, you need places to own and places to rent, you need market value places, and you need affordable housing, and you need social housing, and complete communities has that whole variety bundled up together. And so I think the big opportunity for a city like London is to think strategically, how do we bring the growth into the core and ensure that that growth is going to radiate outwards. And there's always a problem in our mid-sized cities with, with doing this, and it's quite simple. We have a market-driven process where the development industry has a vested interest in building the unsustainable sprawl. And this is why I say strong public policy, because right now, it's been public policy that has led to sprawl. We can change our public policy and we'll get a different outcome. And unfortunately, uh, in most jurisdictions, we talk about a sustainable city, but then we have subsidies inherent in how we operate and maintain suburbs that mean the rest of the city is actually subsidizing something that goes fundamentally against the kind of city that we're seeking to create. So I think it's about the core, and it's about radiating out from the core, and it's about recognizing growth as being precious and not something to be squandered, because until you hit a critical mass, it took Toronto years. It took us 40 years, actually, hit, to hit the critical mass in the downtown. The condo boom we have right now, which is unprecedented, 
uh, across North America. In fact, we laid that out in policy 40 years ago. And it has taken, we really just hit our stride, I would say, about a decade ago. And we're, we're, we're marching into hyperspeed right now. We don't see that growth abating at all, in part because there's been a convergence between environmental objectives, the desires of millennials who grew up in the suburbs and have said, screw that, that's not how I'm raising my family, uh, and a recognition that we can no longer afford to have these highly subsidized peripheral areas. That convergence is driving change. So, um, well, the data doesn't bear that out. Toronto is one of the safest. Toronto is one of the safest cities in Canada, uh, on a per capita basis, um, safer than London. Uh, the least safe city in Canada is Regina. Um, so, if you look at and you know, Regina is a low density, sprawling city. Now, I don't want to oversimplify as you know a direct correlation to density, but that was a question you were asking. In fact, um, I think the data bears out that higher density cities, if they're designed right, design matters, they have eyes on the street, dynamic public spaces, that they are in fact much safer than low density communities. I, I have a story from when I was uh, working as a consultant. I was in Lethbridge, Alberta, and uh, I got there, I was, I was there overnight, I was there a day early, and so in the evening I went out for a run and I ran around the downtown and ran through the coulee and the next morning I got to my meeting with my client and I said, oh, I had the most beautiful run last night. And they went, <gasps> and they were flabbergasted. They, I ran in the city. They said, oh, you really shouldn't do that. It's really not safe. And I was like, what? This is Lethbridge. So sure enough, I went and looked at the data and I was like, holy smokes, this is a really dangerous city. In Toronto, like, not an issue. There's so many people out and around. Uh, I don't think, tw I do not think or worry about my safety in Toronto. I can honestly say ever, I don't worry about that. Do we have a higher concentration of homelessness in the city of Toronto? I don't know that we do compared to a city, again, on a per capita basis like uh, London. Um, but we do have an excellent program called Streets to Homes where we in far in fact work with uh, homeless populations, in fact, to get them into housing. We also have a concentration of social services uh, in the large city. Um, complete communities have those social services as well. One of the reasons why there's a concentration typically in our larger cities is because suburban municipalities didn't have those services. So, you know, Mississauga is a city of 700,000 people, but it was only very recently that Mississauga acknowledged it had a homeless population problem. Why? Because people who are homeless in Mississauga came to Toronto. So complete communities is about providing for everyone in your community. So there's a higher concentration of social services precisely because of other communities that have in fact negated to care for those populations and larger cities have in fact taken on that responsibility and that burden and I think have actually done so very well. But in our downtown where we have a tremendous amount of wealth, we also have a tremendous amount of uh, social services, social housing, because the city of Toronto historically was out ahead of the rest of the country in building in building social housing and affordable housing. And we, in fact, require on our large sites, we require the market as 20% of the units they're building to build affordable housing. So we are, in fact, delivering, um, I think, on that objective in a more substantive way than smaller municipalities are. We have the luxury of growth, which actually allows us to it's harder to do that when you don't have a hot market. Uh, depend, give me a little bit more. What do you mean by the easiest neighborhood? Oh. But critical meaning a neighborhood more in crisis? Sure. So um, we think in terms generally of a hierarchy, and in our official plan, one of our key objectives is to drive our growth to our main transit corridors, in part because we want 
you know, where our city is increasing by our region by 100,000 people a year, uh, but we don't want 100,000 more cars in the city. In fact, we don't want any more cars. And we have seen the opposite happen. We've seen the trend line for driving go down, in part because the transit usage has significantly gone up. There's 1.8 million transit rides in 1.8 million transit rides in Toronto on a daily basis. And just to give you a comparable, there was a big brouhaha around you know, the Women's March in Washington and how many people use transit. And that you know, was a really high number. Well, that was 750. It was half the people that use transit on an average weekday in Toronto. So our starting point is our transit corridors. So because we want to create a transit-oriented city, we look to those transit corridors that have infill potential as the first places that we want to focus on creating infill and mid-rise development in linear neighborhoods. So we're focusing, and we have hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of transit corridors that still look like those strip malls that you saw. So that's what we're choosing to focus on first in the city of Toronto. And it's based on that logic that as the city grows, we don't want more cars, there's no more road capacity, it's not good for the city. We want to be building new housing where people have the opportunity to primarily take transit to get to work. Excuse me, we have one, one more question uh, we have time for, so one last question. It's so funny that you asked that because someone sent me an email today saying I want to build a tiny home in Toronto. Um, tiny homes are interesting in a variety of different ways. I'm sort of fascinated just by the art of them, the art of living, how people live in, in, in tiny homes, and I'm very drawn to the concept. In reality, that's what we're building in our condo community, which we get criticized for, which is, oh, people are living in little shoe boxes. Well, actually, tiny homes are about living in a smaller space, being smarter about that space, having multiple uses in that space. I think that tiny homes um, is kind of a trendy language, and it's typically associated with homes that are on land, but it's also uh, a, a very applicable concept to what we're doing in our mid-rise units and our high-rise units. The, uh, the, in my podcast, Five Kids, One Condo, the father that I speak with on the podcast, I toured his condo. I was like, oh my gosh, five kids in one condo. Uh, I was like, how can this be? And sure enough, I went into his condo with him, and it's you know a tiny home because you've got two girls in one bedroom and three boys in a the equivalent of a bunk bed, but there's three bunks. The girls have two bunks. The girls' bunk bed, the bottom bunk, when the, the, uh, the six-year-old on the bottom gets out of bed in the morning, she gets up, takes the bedding off, pushes the, pushes the boards across, and a table pops up. And right underneath that bunk is now, it looks like a picnic bench. There's a table with two benches on the either side, and that's the desk. That's the place where the girls color and play. The father, his, his bedroom, is a, um, a Murphy bed, so a bed up in the wall. And when the bed is up, underneath it is a desk that latches down. And it's his office. That's where he works all day long. And at night it goes up, and when the kids come home, there's nothing on the floor, and that's where the Lego gets dumped out. It's a playroom. So the concept of tiny homes is really about being strategic about how you use space and not wasting space. And I actually think condos already do that exceedingly well. And looking at how we can continue to design mid-rise condos to respond to the needs of families in the city is a really great opportunity. We have a study called Growing Up Vertical, TO, which is all about raising families in condos. Because people keep saying to us, oh, this condo boom is going to end as soon as these millennials start having babies and they move out to live in the suburbs. So we went, oh, let's see if this is true. So we went out and we consulted with people living in our condo communities, and they told us something very different. They said, no way. We want to live downtown. We want to raise our families in an environment where we can walk everywhere and not own a car. And most of these families don't own a car living in the downtown. But they said there were problems. There were problems with the buildings, problems with the units, problems with the neighborhood. So we've created guidelines, which we're launching in another week, that are about the unit design, the building design, and the neighborhood design in order to respond to the needs of families that want to live in a smaller footprint, that want to be able to walk everywhere and have the option of not owning a car. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Um, so can we give Jennifer another round of applause, please?
You're welcome. My name is Joe Henry. I'm the Dean of Students here. And on behalf of the King's Hour Committee, uh, we'd like to thank you for your words. Um, I think for, for me, and I think for many of us in, th in this room, I think it's a, a powerful call to action. It's an action uh, item that we are all considering, certainly within London, as we talk about uh, how we use land, uh, how we uh, engage with transit. So there's lots of conversations that are happening around our city and in our community around how we can be better, how we can grow as a community. I think your words are powerful. And I think certainly on Bell Let's Talk Day, when we're talking about mental health and we're talking about issues related to wellness, your words around uh, pulling together our communities and talking about uh, the importance of building communities for people are more important than ever. Mm -hmm. So uh, on behalf of the King's community and uh, our King's Hour Committee and everyone in the room, we'd like to thank you very much for coming today. And we have some a token of our appreciation. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, just to end off, thank you so much for coming to the King's Hour. Uh, obviously, uh, this is part of an ongoing conversation that begins here um, in the Kenny Theatre and then extends out into our community to talk about issues that matter. So hopefully, uh, this starts to generate a conversation in, in here at King's and beyond. Um, our next King's Hour uh, will be on February the 15th here in the Kenny Theatre at 2.30 uh, PM, different time, so 2.30 PM on February 15th. We, we will be welcoming uh, Susan Dicklitz Nelson, and she'll be talking about issues related to experiential learning, very important uh, concept and pedagogy for our students and, and our faculty and our administrators here at King's. So thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next King's Hour on February 15th. Thank you very much. <laughs>